Hi everyone, thanks everyone for coming to the Canals Brown Bag Committee Brown Bag Series. Uh, Jessica Collier is going to be presenting today. Um, she is a 2018 Canals Fellow in the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Coastal Program where she gets to work with an amazing team of biologists on a wide ranging, uh, well, wide variety of conservation and restoration topics. Jessica earned her B.S. in biology from the University of Fidley. Uh, MS in conservation biology from Central Michigan University, and most recently in her PhD in ecology from the University of Toledo, where she focused on habitat modeling to reintroduce, to reintroduce endangered lake sturgeon into the Great Lakes tributary. I can hand it over. <laughs> Thanks, Ellen. Thank you everyone for coming today and thank you to the people who are turning, tuning in online. Uh, so my talk today is going to be focused a lot on lake sturgeon, um, but it's on the basis of a framework for restoration. And so I'm going to be kind of going through the, the steps of this restoration framework, talking very specifically about how it applies to lake sturgeon. But I want you guys to keep in mind that the basic premise of it can be applied to a lot of different species in different ecosystems. And so I'm going to talk about the issues that come uh, arrive with spe species and population declines and uh, how our, our uh, culture is contributing to it. And then talk, uh, give you an introduction to lake sturgeon in case you're not familiar with them because they're a really amazing species and I want you guys to love them as much as I do. Uh, talk a little bit about my study site and where I was specifically focused and maybe how that can transpose to other regions that you all might be working in. And then discuss in depth a little bit of the framework that um, we derived. So the framework actually comes from a reintroduction plan um, that I wrote as part of my PhD for specifically reintroducing lake sturgeon. But like I said, the framework that comes from it can be applied um, to different species and ecosystems. So most of you here are uh, probably more familiar with the marine world, um, but freshwater ecosystems are incredibly valuable and have for a small area that they encompass a really high biodiversity that often um, it comes under pressure from human influences, whether it be uh, how we're changing soil and water flows into systems, uh, overexploiting species, um, development and building that can degradate habitats or reduce habitats, or the introduction of invasive species. And oftentimes this comes at the expense of the biodiversity and the species population that live in these freshwater systems. So freshwater um, ecosystems, the biodiversity, even though it's high, um, it's at risk in a lot of places uh, with population declines. And it's comparable to the declines that we're seeing in the rainforest. And um, it's five times greater than the extinction rates that we see in terrestrial species. And this can be a big issue um, when it comes to uh, the ecosystem integrity itself with loss of species, but then also the economies that we rely on um, with these species. And so because of this species decline, there's a growing need for us to have collaborative efforts to help address these issues and come up with tools to help mitigate the declines um, and try to restore populations. So oftentimes, as populations are uh, at risk of extinction or extirpation, these are a big problem that usually starts at a very small scale. And we can use, um, mitigate these issues by starting at the small local scale to try to uh, mitigate before it becomes a much larger issue. And so oftentimes this comes with restoration work that might include translocation, propagation, or reintroduction of species. And so that's what I'll be focusing on is species reintroductions. So I'm going to give you the example of the local problem that I was specifically focused on, and this was the lake sturgeon um, in an Ohio tributary. And in Ohio, lake sturgeon are considered uh, a state endangered species. And they were once very abundant in the Maumee River, but they're currently extirpated. And the Maumee River is a tributary to the Great Lakes. It's in northwest Ohio, um, and it flows about 210 kilometers from the confluence here near Fort Wayne, Indiana, into Lake Erie, and it's the largest tributary by watershed size to the Great Lakes. Um, I was specifically focusing on what's in the red rectangle, which is the lower Maumee River system, because there is a dam in place, um, it's a low head dam right here, the Grand Rapids Providence Dam, that blocks migration access for species that are coming into the river. So I was focused mostly on um, restoration efforts in the lower part of the Maumee River. <clears throat> 
So why were we focusing on the Maumee River? Well, historically, Lake Erie had the highest population of sturgeon compared to all of the Great Lakes. Um, and in Lake Erie, there was 19 historic spawning stocks, which are represented by those little yellow stars. It might be kind of hard to see, but it's important to note that of the 19 historic sp uh, spawning stocks, only 14 of those still exist. And they're found in the, the connecting channels of the St. Clair Detroit River system and the Niagara River. And the red circle is indicating the Maumee, where the focus of this project took place. And so the Lake St. Clair Detroit River system with the three remaining spawning stacks here has one of the highest populations of Lake Sturgeon throughout the Great Lakes. And so researchers want to know, well, is it possible that since it's so close, to where the Maumee River is, could those fish actually repopulate the Maumee on their own? And so researchers tagged a couple hundred fish and were monitoring their movement and found that no fish ever entered the Maumee River and through the tagged fish. They also did some surveys out on the river and never found any untagged fish. So it's unlikely that sturgeon are gonna be able to repopulate the Maumee um, on their own. And historically, the Maumee River had a very high population of lake sturgeon in it, with one record saying that you could possibly walk across the river on the backs of sturgeon without ever getting your feet wet. Um, so there are several hundred fish coming in. They're no longer found in the river, and research in the past couple decades is not finding any evidence that they're reproducing or um, that there's juveniles for recruitment. So what happened to lake sturgeon? Why did their populations decline? Why are they no longer found in the Maumee? This is a general overview of the, the history of lake sturgeon throughout the Great Lakes. So they were once very abundant around the 1850s. Um, and then there was a, a commercial fishery that opened for them. And by 1885, um, they were removing about 2.1 million kilograms, which is the equivalent of about roughly 93,000 sturgeon harvested just from Lake Erie every year. And this went on for about 10 years before the population very quickly declined. And by 1920, there was such a small uh, catch that the Lake Erie uh, uh, fishery closed. By the 1960s, all commercial fisheries for Lake Sturgeon throughout the Great Lakes ceased. And about that time in the 60s and 70s, oh, sorry. So there's a period of widespread decline. And then in the 60s and 70s, researchers were starting to finally um, publicize how bad the overharvesting was, with them realizing that sturgeon populations across the whole Great Lakes were at about 1% of their historic levels. And so this was followed by, in about the late 1990s, mid 2000s, this increasing interest in building models um, to look at the habitat and to restore sturgeon populations. So if you're unfamiliar with sturgeon, I'll give you a little bit of background on them. They're considered dinosaurs of the deep because they are over 100 um, million years old and they've been around since the time of dinosaurs, relatively unchanged that time period. They're extremely amazing charismatic fish. They don't have scales. Instead, they have these rows of scoots, these bony plates across their body, which makes them look kind of prehistoric. They are the longest lived and the largest freshwater species in the Great Lakes. And sturgeon in general are the largest freshwater species in North America. Lake sturgeon are highly migratory. When they have a river system that is open and undammed, they've been known to travel up to 250 kilometers for migration. Um, but even though they live a long time, it actually takes them a long time before they reach um, an age that they can start reproducing, which is detrimental for when they're being over harvested because they take so long um, before they reach maturity. They're an intermittent spawner, which means that they don't reproduce every year. But when the females do reproduce, they can produce a lot of eggs. And the older and bigger female is, the more eggs that she can reproduce. What's also really interesting about this species is that they imprint on the rivers that they're born in. And so that means that they are recognizing some kind of chemical cue within the system that helps them remember and come back to it later in their life to reproduce. So if you have a population of sturgeon that have been extirpated, they're no longer in a certain system, they're no longer there to reproduce, they're not imprinting and there's none to come back later. If you want to reintroduce them, you can't just take fish from one area and put them in a river or in a lake because they're gonna migrate back out to where they imprinted on before. So that comes into play later when we talk about our reintroduction efforts. So one of the big issues, not just with the over harvesting, was that initially sturgeon, before there was a, ha a fishery for them, they were considered a nuisance. They're such a big fish, they have these 
uh, big bony plates, and they would often get entangled in commercial fishermen's nets. And so um, in the early to mid 1800s, they were considered a nuisance species and just routinely um, exterminated when they were encountered. And then the commercial fishery developed and people realized, oh, their meat is tasty when it's smoked and their swim bladders can be used to clarify beer and wine and their eggs can be used for caviar and you can burn their fat for fuel. And so there was a lot of use for sturgeon. That was the development of the commercial fishery that um, really decimated their populations. But it wasn't just the fishery. Um, simultaneously with that, there was a lot of issues on the landscape that were occurring and human actions that were reducing, um, deg degradating their habitat. And this came from deforestation, siltation, log sluicing, which routinely um, messed with their, their spawning sites, their uh, spawning shoals, and pollution from industry, mining, and agriculture. And on top of all of that, we were putting in dams in a lot of the river systems, so blocking their migration so they could no longer access that. And this was bad not just for sturgeon, but a whole bunch of species of fish. So there was a lot of contributing factors that were causing sturgeon populations to decline. And so because they're this big, beautiful, charismatic species, they're, um, and they're recognized as, they're listed actually in every state and province surrounding the Great Lakes. So there's this renewed interest um, to try to um, reintroduce and restore their populations across the Great Lakes Basin. So this is the framework for a reintroduction that I'm gonna be talking about here. This was, came from an outline in our reintroduction um, report that we wrote for our efforts. And I'm going to be talking about sturgeon this whole time, but I want you guys to be thinking about how this can apply to other species and to other systems. So I'm going to go through each of these um, topics. I'm going to spend an inordinate amount of time on number one, which is assessing the habitat, because that was the focus of my PhD. That's where I came into this project, was to build models for looking at, is the habitat still there for sturgeon? So I'm going to talk a lot about that, but I'll touch upon each of these. So the first part is assessing current habitat. Before you do a species reintroduction, it's important that you ask these questions. Is the habitat intact um, in the system to support the species? And is the habitat there to support multiple life stages? So for sturgeon in a river system, they need a spawning site and they need a nursery habitat for their fish. So it's important that we're not just focusing on is spawning habitat there because if they reproduce, lay their eggs, those little fish hatch out, and then there's no nursery habitat, it's not going to make for successful reintroduction. So you have to ask those questions. And then you want to know, are reintroduction efforts the best use of the resources? So when we're working with sturgeon, these are uh, a listed species across their range. We want to make sure that if we're going to be taking fish or gametes from one area and reintroducing them, that we're making the best use of those resources, that we're not wasting gametes and eggs from a critical population, that they will be able to survive. So what we did for, to answer these questions is we use something called a habitat suitability index model. And these models are widely used in species reintroduction efforts for mammals, birds, fish, and plants. And they work by evaluating the habitat requirements of the different life stages of your target organism um, and using their life history traits. And it'll provide this overall index value that says we used to scale of one to uh, zero to one this overall index value that says how suitable is that area for reintroduction. So for sturgeon, we were looking at their life characteristics are tied very closely to substrate, water velocity, and water depth. So those are the characteristics that we evaluated. Um, we mapped these in ArcGIS, and then we would reclassify them, and we were looking at two life stages, the spawning adult fish and age zero, or the fish in their first year of life. And so we would, we would individually look at the habitat characteristics, how does that qualify for an adult fish? How does that qualify for an age zero fish? And we built a, a model structure that looks similar to this, where we had for each habitat characteristic for substrate, if it was like sand, silt, clay, gravel, cobble, where does it fall into good, moderate, or poor? And then we would add all of these layers together into this overall model. And I'll step through this here in a moment. So we collected the data using, for substrate, side scan sonar throughout the whole lower 56 kilometers of the river. And then we imported it into a program called SonarWiz. And we hand delineated all the individual patches of substrate. And then we used ground truthing to make sure what we classified from the sonar is what was actually out in the field. 
and we and we ground truthed it. We collected water depth simultaneously uh, as we were collecting the sonar images, and then because it was across multiple days, we standardized it to one um, sampling depth for to standardize our water levels. And then we created a velocity map using the Army Corps' HECRAS software. And because we had our adults and our age zero fish, we used the average April velocity about the time that they were going to be uh, spawning. The average April velocity from 1930 to 2015 to inform. Our, our model and then we use the average June velocity for the age zero fish. So I'm going to go through a couple slides that look very similar to this where we have this is the lower Maumee River what's in the red triangle up here this is kind of the blown up version of it where the dam is located down here at this bottom part and then this is the mouth of the river. And I'm gonna show you what the raw data looked like very briefly so you could see it. So for our substrate, we would have these generalized polygons of the dominant substrate types throughout the whole river that looked like this, where we had our seven classifications of substrate. We had water depth, which ranged throughout the river from two meters to about 13 meters. So in this section, these warmer colors that you can see here, this was a pretty shallow part of the river. And then our water velocity ranged from about zero in these backwater areas around an island to greater than 1.77 meters per second. And so we would take an individual habitat layer, like this is the overall generalized substrate composition throughout the Maumee, and we'd classify it into the suitability index for that habitat layer. So if we're looking at our age zero fish, anything that was sand, silt, gravel, or cobble, like you would see here, was classified as good in this green color. Anything that was a clay or a boulder, so the blue here, the clay, classified as moderate, and bedrock was poor for our age zero fish. So the areas of dominant bedrock classified as poor. So that's how we took the individual habitat layers and classified them into a suitability layer. And then we'd add the three layers together. So for our two groups of fish, this is what our model results look like in general. So we had our spawning adult fish. There's these areas of green right in here mixed with yellow. That's the best spawning habitat in the Maumee for lake sturgeon with a couple small areas of green up here. Most of it was yellow throughout with some poor spawning sites up here, which are those really soft sediments. For our age zero fish, we had some pretty excellent, good um, nursery habitat around this area, um, the dominant bedrock area classified as poor, and then again, the majority classified as moderate. So it broke down to something that looked like this, where we got an overall amount or proportion of our habitat that would be good for supporting spawning for our age zero fish. And while about 7% of the habitat may not seem like a lot of good spawning habitat, in other rivers that support sturgeon, they're usually about 1% to 10% of those rivers is, is their adequate spawning habitat. So it doesn't have to be a high amount. What's also important is that we looked at the amount of area that was there. And so if we have a target population that we want to be about 1,500 fish, and we had 156 hectares, we could do a quick back of the envelope calculation and the estimate that we would be able to host more than enough to reach our target population. So even though it doesn't seem like there's a lot of good spawning habitat, it's sufficient um, for sturgeon. And what's also important to note is that for our good habitat for those age zero fish, not only was there about 25% of the river's good habitat, what's also important was that it was either adjacent to or downstream of those spawning areas, or the big good spawning areas. So if the sturgeon are coming to that place to spawn, as the eggs hatch, those those age zero fish um, drift slightly down the river, they're gonna settle out into good nursery habitat, and so they'll be able to survive. So the first part of this was looking at can sturgeon, is the habitat in the river there to support sturgeon? And we said, yes. The second part of the framework was then looking at, are there any other potential habitat constraints that could um, negate the, the restoration efforts. So the first thing we wanted to consider was water temperature. And there was concern that maybe the Maumee might be too warm for sturgeon. And so we compared the Maumee River to two southern uh, rivers, the Coosa in um, North Carolina and the French Broad in Tennessee. And both of these rivers have lake sturgeon populations. They're both southern warmer rivers. And so looking at the water temperatures, we determined that the Maumee River was either significantly cooler or during the hottest months, it was not any warmer than those other two rivers that have sturgeon populations. So we said, okay, temperature isn't necessarily gonna be a habitat constraint. We're also concerned about the dam. 
So the dam is about 56 river kilometers up. We know historically they swam much farther past the dam. So we were concerned, is the presence of the dam going to be an issue? And so looking at the amount of habitat that's still below it um, and looking, doing some calculations for their su sustained swim speed, because we were concerned that maybe the velocity from the dam might preclude them from surviving there. We determined that, no, the dam also was not going to be an issue. And the next thing we wanted to look at was would the shipping channel. So the lower uh, 14 kilometers of the river is a maintained shipping channel that's regularly dredged. So we were concerned, how is the dredging going to affect those young fish? Um, and then also, is there going to be the potential for boat strikes? And so looking at other systems and comparing the numbers to population detriments in other systems, we determined also not likely to impact their survival. So it was important to look at not just the physical habitat to support them, but if there would be any other habitat characteristics that might preclude restoration success. The third part of our framework was to consider our stocking strategy, and there's two components to this. The first one is the genetic component, because um, for sturgeon and some other species, it's important to note where the genotype of target populations is coming from, because there might be northern versus southern populations that could influence their survival or their behavior in a certain system. And so you want to consider genetic pop genetic source populations, but then also how we are going to collect our gametes. And so we know from doing um, research and from past projects that directly collecting sperm and eggs is much more successful than going out and collecting already hatched larvae. The survival rate is much higher. We're also looking at where is that genetic population going to come from? And so there is analysis by Amy Welsh and her group that looked at genetic stocking units throughout the Great Lakes. And it might be kind of hard to see, but there's these different colors of populations um, throughout the system. And what we found was here where the mommy is, the St. Clair Detroit River, which is going to be our closest genetic match, um, was within the same GSU unit. And so we knew that it would be a good genetic match for our source population. But also important to that is that the population in that donor system is large enough that taking gametes from it is not going to be a detriment. So you want to ensure that as you're doing a reintroduction and you're, you're pulling species or pulling gametes from one population that you're not going to uh, significantly affect your donor population. And then we wanted to consider the genetic diversity. And so making sure that we're collecting enough females and males each year that we have a good genetic diversity of the fish that are being released. So we don't end up with a genetic bottleneck of fish that aren't um, getting enough flow of uh, genetic information. So the second part of our stocking strategy was then the rearing technique. And this is something that we are still figuring out. And for people who are doing restoration across the board, we're learning more and more about how to raise species in captivity for reintroduction. For sturgeon, we don't know at what point they imprint on their target system. Is it from the moment they hatch? Or can you take a fish that's been raised in one system introduce it to another within a couple months, and that's enough time for them to imprint then on their new system. So we're testing a couple ways of rearing fish. One is a traditional hatchery, where we're working with the US Fish and Wildlife's Genoa National Fish Hatchery doing traditional rearing. So the fish are gonna be raised in well water. They won't have any specific chemical component to imprint on, and then they're gonna be released at about five to six months. And so we wanna know, is that enough time, that five to six months of age, enough for them to imprint? Or do we have to do a stream side rearing? Is that the only way that they're going to imprint, where they're actually hatched in the target system's river water, imprinting from day one? And so we're going to be looking at um, you know, which one of those techniques is going to be best. We are releasing about 3,000 fish a year, half from each of our rearing techniques. This came from trying to find a target population after 20 years. So we were looking at what would be an estimated survival rate of fish in each year class. And then if we want to have an estimated 1,500 fish reproducing in 20 years, um, how many do we have to stock each year for that? So we did some back calculations, about 3,000 fish. And then we're going to determine, um, using some of our, our later, um, a few things I'm going to talk about in a moment, which one of our techniques is going to be more successful. So traditional, ha uh, traditional rearing at a hatchery is much cheaper, using the well water, than building individual streamside rearing facilities for each place you want to reintroduce species. So we, we can get more information on how to get fish uh, to imprint on target systems. We'll be able to reduce the cost of rearing. <clears throat> 
The fourth part was then constructing the rearing facility. So the traditional one at Genoa National Fish Hatchery was already in place, but then we needed our streamside facility. So we partnered with the Toledo Zoo, which is um, world renowned for their uh, species conservation programs. And you can see in this picture here, this yellow outline is part of the zoo property. The red outline is where the streamside facility is going to go. And this is the Maumee River running next to us. So we're building the facility right on the river, and we're going to be pumping the water into, um, it's going to be a, a kind of looks like a utility trailer. Um, we'll have these egg incubating jars and these rearing tanks pumping water in. So the fish at the, the streamside facility are going to be in Maumee River water from day one. Then for stocking, again, we had to estimate what is going to be our target stocking population each year. And we decided 3,000 fish. Um, and this is planned for 20 years. And our goal is to eventually have bless you, a self-sustaining population of fish, where after 20 years or so, we're hoping that we don't have to continually stock these fish. They're going to be able to reproduce, survive on their own, um, and become self-sustaining. And all of this is going to co coincide with education and outreach initiatives. And this was a big part of our framework because what, what restoration, uh, tech, restoration ecologists have learned through time is that you need that public buy-in and you need public support. And so without the education and outreach with the partnerships, a lot of times these projects don't have longevity to them. And so we're working with different partners to help develop ways of getting the public excited about this, getting involved throughout every step of the process, keeping them updated. Um, there's going to be touch tanks at the Toledo Zoo that people can come in and they can touch some of the, the sturgeon at different ages and live video feeds, just like with the eagle cams. We're going to have sturgeon cams so people can check out the baby sturgeon as they're, they're being reared. Uh, we have annual release ceremonies. I'll talk a little bit about that little bit more about that in a moment and then developing curriculum um, to engage kids at all age levels and through a couple of different partnerships and a really big part of our education and outreach goes to the anglers so the people who are either recreational or commercial fishermen because as we're reintroducing a fish species they're more likely to encounter them as they're fishing and we want them to know what the fish is that it's an imperiled species how do you handle the fish um, you know what kind of you know, gear you can or can't use or what's the most detrimental to them. And then for our commercial fishermen, letting them know our fish are going to be tagged. Are you willing to do scans for the fish and report that data for us? So there's a lot of education and outreach going to our um, fishermen as well. Another part of this framework was the biological um, monitoring and evaluation. So every fish that's released every year is going to get a PIT tag or a passive integrated transponder, which is a microchip similar to what you would put in your dog or cat. And so as that fish is encountered, um, somebody could scan it and get the exact information on the parentage of that fish, what kind of rearing facility it came from, and when it was released. So we'll have the age and then be able to uh, input gender for that fish later on as well. So we'll be doing um, field surveys with gill nets and then acoustic telemetry. A small subset of our fish are also going to get acoustic transmitters in them so that we'll be able to actively track their movement after they're released. And then all of this is going to give us information on what is their survival, what kind of habitats do they use, um, what is the contribution of our restoration efforts to the whole Lake Erie sturgeon population. And then after 20 years or so, as these fish are coming back, those pit tags are still be active, we'll be able to scan them and then learn, you know, from our two rearing techniques, traditional versus stream side, what was the survival rate? What's the return rate? Do any of these fish stray into other systems that we weren't anticipating? Is there a difference between the way we reared them and their survival and return to the system? And then, sorry, and then all of that, of course, is going to be adaptive management. And so um, as, we're, as we're tracking these fish and we're learning more about their survivability to the next life stages, if survival is higher than we anticipated, we might be able to stock fewer fish each year. If it's lower than we anticipated, we'll have to increase our stocking efforts to try to reach our target population at the end. And then with all this comes the regulation and enforcement because they're an imperiled species. They're listed in every state and province of the Great Lakes. We want to make sure that people know that they're endangered. We want them to know how to handle them. But then we also want enforcement in place so that we don't repeat history. So we don't rebuild a population that then declines again based on human interactions. Um, so this will also include monitoring 
and uh, enforcing poaching, which um, can be an issue in some areas. Sturgeon, when they come in to spawn, are pretty docile, and in some cases, you can go down to the river and physically pick them up without much of a fight. Uh, and then people do that for their caviar. And the black market for caviar is actually um, a pretty, uh, pretty bad thing for the sturgeon. Uh, and then we'll have protocol for what happens if there's uh, incidental catch or bycatch of sturgeon in the commercial fishery. And then the last big part of this framework is the long-term management and goals. And for restoration projects, without these long-term plans, we often find that the restoration efforts aren't successful. They might be good in the first couple of years, but when you have a fish, especially like a lake sturgeon, that takes a really long time to mature and for the population um, to rebound, you really need to have those protection and restoration efforts in place for a long time. And so the long-term goals are a big part of ensuring that the project is as successful as possible. And that includes the adaptive management. So how do we raise these fish and how many of them do we stock? And are there different rearing techniques that we've learned between the to um, that might make it more successful to restore their populations in other areas. Another important part about the research that we're doing is that for age zero lake sturgeon, we don't know a lot about what happens to these fish after they're, they're spawned. We can find their spawning locations, but after they hatch and drift down and swim away, we don't really know where we, they go. We don't know what kind of habitats they're using. It can be different from system to system. That's the other hard part about trying to model sturgeon is that they have kind of a, a plastic behavior depending on what system they're in and what's available. And so trying to figure out, especially for the systems you're reintroducing them in, what kind of habitats are they using? How long do they stay in the river before they migrate out? In some systems, they leave the river within their first year, migrate to the lake. In other river systems, they might stay in for three to five years before they migrate out. Um, so just learning more about their, their survival, what kind of habitat tolerances they're gonna have, um, just gathering more information for the, the H0 fish. And then the other important part of this long-term management is we have this huge uh, collaboration that's in place for this restoration effort. So making sure that the collaboration stays intact, um, that all the stakeholders are engaged on board throughout it, and that the invested parties, um, and that there's public outreach to keep um, the enthusiasm and support for these kind of projects going long-term. So the implications for reintroduction for lake sturgeon, which can also be applied to other species, is that you know we have these habitat models that suggest that yes, um, the habitat is in place. We think from that that the reintroduction is gonna be successful. So it's gonna support our efforts um, to, to reintroduce sturgeon. And this was a big part of the plan. We initially proposed the reintroductions without our habitat models. And funding sources said, no, we need more information. So usually that habitat modeling is that big first step um, to get projects and restoration efforts off the ground. And the HSI models that are developed here, like I said, they've been used for other species, um, but they can specifically in the Maumee River be used for other species in that system. So walleye or uh, uni freshwater mussels or um, white suckers. But we can also then take that tool and look at some of these other river systems. So if you remember from the beginning, we had these 19 historic spawning sp stocks of Lake Sturgeon Lake Erie, now reduced down to four. And we have all these on the southern shore of Lake Erie, all these other populations um, that are gone. So if we can take that model structure and then apply it to these other river systems, we could then prioritize, okay, which habitats or which river systems can we do a reintroduction next? So for us, we didn't have to do specific habitat restoration um, because the models told us the habitat is intact. But in some of these other systems, they may not have sufficient spawning habitat. They may not have sufficient nursery habitat. And if we want to restore the species, we'll have to determine what kind of habitat restoration needs to go in place first before we can do the species restoration. So the framework is this comprehensive tool um, that can be used for multiple species, not just sturgeon. Um, so it can be applied to different species, different systems. Um, and what's important to know about it that I kind of, I'll reiterate, is that these conservation efforts um, can fall short if we don't have long-term management and long-term goals in place um, to keep them active and successful. We also know that these successful restoration projects really does hinge upon public sentiment. And so getting, getting buy-in from different community members, getting buy-in and, and support from um, a bunch of stakeholders is a really important aspect of making sure that long-term restoration is successful.
and then of course the public education and outreach which oftentimes people don't think about and it's overlooked but it's a really important part of making sure that um, there's awareness for these activities uh, and that people um, can get excited about it to support it so again, I'm just going to do the brief overview. This is the framework, and like I've said, you know, I've given you all the examples based on sturgeon, but the basic principles are there that can be applied to many different species and other systems. But I also want to talk about what I call the three Ps. So these are the unsung heroes of restoration efforts that I really didn't touch upon here, and that was permitting partnerships and planning. So for our project, we were working binationally. So we were in both Canada and US waters for collecting fish. We were working across state borders, so Wisconsin, Michigan, and Ohio. And so we had a lot of permits that we needed to work through, not just across these boundaries, but then because we're working with imperiled species. So permitting is a really big first step for reintroduction efforts. And then the partnerships, and I've kind of talked about it throughout the way, but there are so many stakeholders and in invested parties. And I'll, I'll show you the, the list of collaborators for the, um, the Sturgeon collaboration next. But then there was a lot of community partnerships and uh, stakeholders that were involved. A lot of the park and education um, groups wanted to host talks about this or do workshops or create the curriculum to get people excited about Sturgeon. We also had a lot of support from our local journalists and news agencies that always wanted to come in. Of course, it's Sturgeon. They're easy to love. They're cool to film. But we had people always wanting to come talk about, you know, how is the work coming? And they were writing articles about, you know, how the, the rearing facility was being built and what stage it was at. And um, this year, because this is the first year for Sturgeon reintroduction, I wanted to throw this up. So this is the flyer that's being circulated right now. So the first Sturgeon mommy or first Sturgeon release in the Maumee River is set for August 6th of this year. And I know the text isn't there for you. I don't expect you to read it, but just want to show you that there's this huge public engagement going on right now where people can adopt uh, a sturgeon and they'll get the tag number for it and they'll get updates and um, people can come to the release ceremony and there will be all these different partners and stakeholders there to to get you know the community just as involved as we've been. And so that's a huge part of it. And then the planning part was also something that um, most people don't think about for reintroduction. So we actually did um, dry runs and dry collections for every step of this. So um, before this year, last year we went out and we were doing dry runs of how do we, you know, how do we collect our adult fish? Um, for some of them, we did hormone therapies to get them to spawn all at the same time. It was using uh, a carp pituitary hormone to get them to spawn on the same day. So we weren't out there for weeks on end collecting eggs on different days. Um, so we did a dry run of the spawning and collection. We actually did a run of what is it like to drive from across the bridge, across the borders, up into Wisconsin, make sure that you know we had our routes planned for this. Um, we did dry runs at the uh, streamside rearing facility to make sure all the water was flowing and things were in place, all the mechanical components were there. So planning across the board, not just with the permitting and with the partnerships, but all these other facets of the reintroduction. So these three things, although they weren't specifically talked about in the framework, are such a a huge part of making sure reintroduction efforts are successful. So I just wanted to again touch upon, this is the Maumee River Lake Sturgeon Reintroduction Collaborative. So it's a binational group of researchers and managers that had a lot of time and effort into different facets of this project, whether it was um, the physiology of the fish or the habitat of the fish or the physical collection of them, or how do you raise them in cactus captivity. And so it's a great team of researchers. And then for my part of the project for my PhD, I just wanted to call out, um, you know, the, the people that I had worked with at the Fish and Wildlife and who took part, helped with developing the restoration plan that I used as the framework, um, and then in my research lab for helping collect the data. So with that, <laughs> I thank you guys for patiently listening to me, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Mm -hmm. but first anyone in the room have a question yes how do the acoustic transmitters work so they get uh the fish get a, a transmitter implanted under their skin and then out in the great lakes we have something called glados the great lakes 
Acoustic Telemetry Obser Observation System. Did I say that right? Okay. Uh, and it's all these receivers that are throughout, not just the Maumee River, but then throughout the Great Lakes. And there's thousands. Yeah. There's thousands of these receivers. So as the fish swims past, it pings it. Kind of like um, what's the, the smart trip that's in your car? So when you're going through the tolls on the highway, it's yeah. kind of similar to that. So as you go by the transmitter, it'll ping and say, okay, the fish went by here. Does that make sense? It does have a battery. And the battery life depends on how big the transmitter is. So there's different sizes based on the size of the fish. And then the frequency of your ping. So you can set it to ping really, really uh, frequent so that you want to make sure it's not missed by a fish that swims very quickly past the transmitter. Or you can set it to a slower ping, so it's only pinging, you know, every minute or so. Um, <laughs> does that, did I say that right? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yes. I have a couple questions. Yeah. Depending on that thread and the pit tags, you don't have to extract those anymore then to determine what fish it is. Okay, so the question is, do you have to extract the pit tags? Yeah. No, the pit tags will stay in the fish. So you can determine when they return if they, what type of Yes, so as the fish returns, you can determine. So the pit tag, it's an individual number on the fish, and it'll give us all the information. We know it's parentage, so when we're collecting the gametes, the male and the female will each get pit tagged. And so we'll know which male and which female that fish came from. We'll know which site that the gametes were collected from, which rearing technique was used, uh, which facility you know it was reared in, and then when it was released. So we'll have an age on it as well. And are you expecting the first returns to be when they're like initially mature or even in the interim years before that, like just in three or four years? Yeah, so when do we expect the fish to return to the river? For you, it's gotta be like, I wanna know when this thing's coming back. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so yeah, I do. I want to know where is that fish going? When does it come back? We don't expect them to return until they're sexually mature. Usually once they migrate out into the river or excuse me, out into the lake systems, they'll stay out there um, until they are sexually mature. Then they migrate back into the rivers to spawn and migrate out. So they spend the majority of their lives in lake systems and usually just come into the rivers for spawning. So we don't expect to see them to return until you know, 12 to 15 years for a male, we don't expect to see reproduction for at least 20 years until the females are sexually uh, mature. Yeah. We used to have a pretty thriving sturgeon population in Chesapeake Bay, and mm -hmm. they've been all, almost totally wiped out. We did a paper job of storing the, the rockfish. Mm -hmm. Any hope for the sturgeon, do you think? So is there any hope for a sturgeon in the Chesapeake Bay? Uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, there would be Atlantic and short-nosed sturgeon. And I'm the eternal optimist that says yes. I mean, there's there's always hope. Our restoration techniques are always improving. Um, and there's actually, for Atlantic sturgeon, there is only one federal hatchery that raises them, and that's in South Carolina. And then there's a, a hatchery in Canada that also raises them. And so what we need to do is, uh, I. I for the Chesapeake Bay, there would need to be an initiative um, from the people that says, you know, we want this this population to be reintroduced and have some kind of framework for rebuilding that population. I don't know much about the Atlantic sturgeon uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, what their numbers are currently at. It might just be something about, uh, you know, do we need to restore their habitat? Is there enough of a remnant population that they could rebound on their own? Uh, if, if there is a habitat restoration, or do we have to come in and assist their populations? And I don't know enough about those numbers, but I am the eternal op optimist that says, yeah, there's always hope for, for restoring them. Is that? <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, so I have a question about the inferencing. Um, yeah. So from my understanding, at least with Atlantic and short nose sturgeon, mm -hmm. they're kind of plastic in where they'll, they'll go river-wise. Yes. Um, at least in Maine. So as, for example, the Penobscot River mm -hmm. got a lot cleaner and more restored, we started seeing Atlantic mm -hmm. shores of sturgeon returning. Is that, so is the imprinting on rivers for lake sturgeon more like more along the lines of salmon where they're, they're only coming back to the one? Mm -hmm. Or do you see them kind of meandering to different river systems? I know you mentioned it at the beginning that you don't, but I guess, is that just a species thing or? Yeah. Yeah, so the, the question is about imprinting and uh, for for lake sturgeon, they uh, when they imprint, they have a really high site fidelity. And so it's somewhere in like 96% of lake sturgeon 
um, go back to the rivers they're born in. For the other species, like you mentioned, for short nose and Atlantic, they imprint, but it is a lot more plastic. They might return to the same general area um, or the same, you know, three, four, five rivers along the coast um, and use some of those other river systems. But for lake sturgeon, it's a much higher site fidelity and they have a lower strain rate. Um, but yeah, for other sturgeon, and it could be the difference between them, lake sturgeon are solely fresh water. They don't migrate out into estuaries or marine systems. For Atlantic and short nose sturgeon, um, they're anadromous. And so, or yes, and Yes, <laughs> sorry, I had to think of the two terms. So they uh, they live out in the oceans and they migrate into the river. So they're going between salt water and fresh water. So it could be something about that um, that changes a little bit of their site fidelity, but they the imprinting rates are different across sturgeon species. They will all imprint to some degree. Lake sturgeon have a really high uh, uh, site fidelity, very low strain rate. Other species stray a little bit more, but it's usually within a certain area. Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah I'll follow. You're going to be using those pit tags to kind of um, fill in the gaps with their life histories since you have the acoustic array set up throughout the yeah, so the question is about using the, the pit tags to fill in life history traits with the acoustic arrays. So those are actually two different things. So there's pit tags and there are acoustic tags. The pit tags, which is the microchip that every fish will get, um, is a passive tag. You actually have to capture the fish and wave the wand over it, just like you would your dog or cat, to get that information. The acoustic tag um, is, it has a, and the pit tags are there for life. Once the microchip is in, it'll be there for the whole life of the fish. The acoustic tags, which is just a small subset of the fish, gets surgically implanted. It has a shorter lifespan, and that's the one that pings off of the arrays. And yes, that's why we're, we're tagging a subset of the fish with the acoustic tags, is we wanna find out, okay, we're gonna release these age zero fish where do they go? You know, what, what, how long are they going to stay in the river? What kind of habitats are they using? We're going to use that information to validate our model to find out, you know, did we successfully predict what was good, moderate, or poor habitat for those age zero fish? Or were we wrong and we need to rethink how we handled the model development? Um, so the two tags work a little bit differently. The, the pit tags are passive. You actually have to have the fish and have, have a wand to scan over it. The acoustic tag is active, so the fish just has to swim by a receiver and it'll ping and we can download that data and know where it was. I think Sarah was next. Sorry, Emily. <laughs> uh, first of all, you did a really great presentation. Everything was really clear from beginning to end and very engaging, so thank you for that. Um, so when you were doing the preliminary research before your actual study, mm -hmm. or I guess other people were doing the research, yeah. you saw that the sturgeon weren't populating the Maumee River on their own. Mm -hmm. How long were those studies going on? Like, how long did you give it to see if they would? That was, um, it started in 2006. So it was about 11 years of watching the fish and not seeing them uh, come back. So, oh, sorry. So the question was um, looking at um, the, the, pre-tagging stuff when we saw that there was a population of fish in the Detroit St. Clair River and none of those tagged fish were coming to the Maumee. How much time were we looking at that to say, okay, they're not going to repopulate on their own? And it was about 11 years. So that project started in 2006. And so we had 11 years of data in 2017 that was saying, okay, they're, they're not coming into the Maumee River. So for another study, if someone's mm -hmm. doing a reintroduction study, mm -hmm. what would you say would be like the minimum time to survey an animal to know whether you should introduce it or not? So what is the minimum time to survey an animal before you reintroduce it? And I think that's going to depend a lot on the life history characteristics of that. So for a sturgeon, I'd say it's going to be a longer period of time because one, they don't reproduce um, every year and they take a long time to reach maturity. Um, but so for smaller species, species that reproduce um, more frequently, you know, I think it would be a much shorter period of time. So it all just depends on the life history characteristics of your target species on how long do you observe them before reintroduction. And then also knowing a little bit more, if you can, about the backstory. How long have they been gone? How do they behave in other systems? So for sturgeon, if this was a um, maybe an Atlantic sturgeon that, um, you know, those fish kind of fluctuate between different river systems. So maybe those in the Chesapeake Bay, you know, they might stray into the Chesapeake and, you know, increase their populations naturally through that strain. Um, you know, kind of just knowing about the behavior of a target species on, you know, is that a possibility or 
do we not see them do that at all? So it depends. <laughs> Emily? Um, I know this is probably out of the scope of the like, scope of your project, uh -huh. but there's always a question of how are raised fish different from wild fish? And so are there also tags on wild fish? That's a really good question. So is there a difference between the, the raised fish, reared fish versus the ones that are naturally or wild reproduced. And your question was, are the wild ones tagged? Like, yeah, is there a network of wild tagged fish? There is a network of wild tagged fish. It usually doesn't start until they're adults, though, because we don't really know where the little ones go. Um, so if younger ones are captured, and there are, uh, in the Great Lakes, there are um, survey efforts to try to find where these juvenile fish are. Um, and they've had pretty low success compared to the adults. So when those smaller fish are captured, yes, they are tagged, uh, usually with the pit tags, sometimes with the acoustic transmitters. We have a lot more information about the adult fish um, and what, how they travel, how far their, their home range is, things like that. Um, and that's one of the things that we're also looking at is what, what are the behavioral differences between you know, the, the different rearing techniques, especially. Um, and we just, we don't have enough information on the juvenile naturally reproduced fish to be able to compare their behavior to the wild caught, but, or excuse me, the raised ones. So hopefully in the future, we can answer some of those questions too. Yeah, yeah. Um, first up, are there any plans to create passage past the Grand Rapids Dam to establish a population <laughs> farther up the Maumee? Are there any questions to create passage of, on the, the Maumee River Dam, the Grand Rapids Providence Dam to get fish further upstream? Um, there's a lot of talk about that. Uh, I don't think the dam is going to come down, um, but there's talk about doing uh, a natural by channel around it to, to create passage. There is currently a small channel uh, that has a historic, um, I'm trying to think, it's a, a towpath um, that was there. I don't think the towpath is big enough to uh, get fish to tune into it to know that they can use that as a bypass. So you'd have to restructure that. There, there's talk about it. Um, there's a lot that goes into um, fish passage in terms of the economics of that system. There's a lot of recreation that occurs behind the dam. Um, there have been some studies to find out what would happen if that dam came down, looking at the sediment flow, changes in water velocity, the flood regime, um, and those studies so far have been positive in terms of you know no uh, detrimental effects to people living downstream. There will be a pulse of sediment, um, but you know it would feasibility-wise you could bring the dam down. But there's a whole another economic component that goes into it that I am not able to speak about. And so there currently isn't any solid plan in place for fish passage, but there's discussion about can we do it? Can we especially do a bypass channel? And so we'll have to see where those talks go in the future. Um, but that is the hope. And that was actually a, a side project that I had started and never got to complete was what does that upstream habitat look like? So, you know, by doing fish, fish passage, how much area are we going to open up? Um, but we haven't really completed that part either. Uh -huh. Are there any threats to the sturgeon population from invasive species in the Great Lakes? Are there any threats to sturgeon populations from invasive species in the Great Lakes? Um, there are some threats depending on the life stage. So there's a fish called the round goby, um, which is a small uh, benthic fish that loves to eat eggs. And so uh, they will prey on sturgeon eggs, but sturgeon in reverse also like to eat round gobies. <laughs> um, so there... There are, like any, any ecological web, there are impacts. Um, I don't know of any specific invasive species that is precluding sturgeon. Um, we've looked at, you know, sturgeon also eat uh, an invasive mussel called zebra mussels, zebra and quagga mussels. And we are hoping that maybe, you know, by uh, increasing sturgeon populations, because they like to eat mussels, maybe they could have an effect <laughs> on the, the dry sand of the zebra and quagga mussel populations. But studies in the Detroit River where the population of sturgeon is, is really high and stable, they found that they don't actually eat enough to affect that invasive species. But um, there are some invasive species. There's some issues with uh, a couple viruses, um, like uh, VHS viral hemorrhagic, se hemorrhagic septicemia, um, that it could influence uh, sturgeon, um, but no direct causes 
We're also looking a little bit at um, sea lamprey. So sea lamprey attached to like sturgeon, they can cause um, some issues with their body conditions, some mortality. Um, I don't think we know enough information yet to know how high that mortality is. And we also don't think that compared to the sturgeon we've caught to other fish like lake trout, um, the, the sea lamprey have a much higher detrimental effect on lake trout than they do on the sturgeon. So there are some interactions, some negative influences, um, but not anyone that I can speak of that would necessarily be decimate the, the sturgeon population. I'm going to do uh, one more online and then hop back. To okay. <laughs> how successful have other reintroduction efforts been and how do those con those approaches mm. compare with your approach? Okay. So how successful have other lake sturgeon reintroductions been and how do they compare to our approach? Um, most of the lake sturgeon reintroduction efforts have happened within the past 10 years. And some, there's been a couple that started in the late 1990s. And so for the ones that have started most recently, all we can tell is that so far the fish are doing pretty well in terms of survival. Um, there was a, a reintroduction effort in New York that was about 20 years ago that they're now seeing the sturgeon returning and trying to reproduce. They don't know yet about the success of that reproduction. Um, and then there's some areas around Michigan, especially in the UP where they've been stocking. Um, it's mixed mixed results depending on the population. So there's a couple in Northern Michigan that they have been augmenting the, the population that's there since the mid 1990s and they're not seeing a high recruitment. So they're not seeing a, um, a self-sustaining population of sturgeon and they're using similar techniques in terms of the stream side rearing. Uh, so far, all of the reintroduction efforts are using the similar techniques to us in terms of the stream side rearing. This is the first instance where we're trying to branch out and say, what happens if you raise them traditionally and then reintroduce them? How is the survival and site fidelity any different? So um, it's mixed results kind of across the whole region. For the most part, they're doing pretty well. The survival's there. The biggest hinge for reintroduction is can they become self-sustaining? Is the, the, the spawning habitat there? Is the nursery habitat there? Are they simultaneous? Do they connect? And some some projects aren't considering that, and um, they might not see as good of a success. Um, but for the most part, there's a lot of really successful projects, and the populations are starting to come back, and we're starting to think about it more on larger scales um, to improve the increased populations across the basin. Uh, do we have some questions in the room? Yeah. Um, so I know one of the other kind of perils facing lake sturgeon in the Great Lakes mm -hmm. is uh, the mortality caused by lamprosides. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's not as huge a deal on the mommy, but just yeah. looking at like your habitat suitability models, mm -hmm. are, is that going to be incorporated? That's, uh, that's an excellent question. So Lisa was asking um, about lamprosides, and did we think about that in terms of our reintroduction efforts? And yeah, so that kind of went into, that would fall under the habitat constraints, the second part of the framework. And it was something we were considering. So sea lamprey are often, we're trying to control them with lamprosides. That um, is usually fatal to um, younger lake sturgeon. And so in some areas where they're trying to preclude um, the sea lamprey, that lamprosite is, is really harming the, the young sturgeon. Um, in the Maumee River, we don't have a very high, uh, we don't treat it uh, for, for um, sea lamprey. We don't have a lot of them in there. And so it was something we considered, um, but at this time, it's not an issue um, because they're not treating lamprosite. If in the future we see that um, sea lamprey are increasing in Lake Erie and we're finding a lot of them using the Maumee River, what happens then is we have to start coordinating when does the treatment um, occur and when is going to be the release of sturgeon. So you want to make sure that they don't coincide. And so we can kind of work around, especially in the Maumee right now, when we don't have sturgeon in there. Um, you know, it's not much of an issue because as we reintroduce them, the fish are probably leaving within their first year and they won't be back again. Um, but it's one thing that is considered for the reintroduction efforts is how does that correspond with lamprosite? For us, it didn't. Good question. We have a flurry of left. <laughs> um, and these are all about operating costs mainly. Um, yeah. So are you aware of the costs of the rearing facility constructed at Toledo Zoo? How long is the zoo rearing facility expected to operate? And what's the annual operating cost? Okay. Um, 
I don't want to speak to cost because I don't know it very well. Um, but if they would like to email me, I could find out those those costs. I don't want to throw out numbers and be wrong. Um, so if anybody has uh, questions about the cost, I can easily find that out for you. Um, in terms of how long is the Toledo Zoo rearing facility going to be there, it's planned for 20 years. Um, so we're hoping that after 20 years, the sturgeon population is self-sustaining and we can close that facility and there's not going to be a need for it or we might have to extend it by five to ten years depending on how the population is doing but right now it's planned to be there for 20 years. Um, last question, mm -hmm. uh, what's the purpose of the Providence Dam? Why can't it be removed or replaced with a low slope nature like fish? Yeah so c coming back to the the Grand Rapids Providence Dam that that dam that's 56 river kilometers um, why can it what's the purpose of it um, and why can it be removed or can we put some kind of natural fish passage like a rock ramp or a nature way um, in there to allow for fish passage so um, that dam was built around the mid 1800s I think it was sometime around 1843 and it was there as a uh, water reserves reservoirs um, so holding back water for some of the municipalities. It currently is no longer used that way, but there's a high amount of recreation that occurs. So fishing and boating and campgrounds and then people living along. It's not a reservoir itself. It's just a, a pretty wide part of the river. Um, and so the current purpose right now is, is mostly recreation and people that live around it. Um, and that's usually where a lot of the um, pushback. So one, it's a, it's a historical site. Um, there used to be, pretty sure there used to be a mill that was associated with that dam. And so there's historic parts for that with the towpaths. And so, um, you know, people who are tied to, you know, wanting to preserve that history of it, but then it's also, you know, people's livelihoods in terms of the, the recreation economy tied to it is a big push for keeping it in place. Um, the, the nature ways and the rock ramps um, for sturgeon. So sturgeon, passage is a little bit different than it is. So not all fish passageways work for every species. Um, sturgeon can't jump like salmon do. And so to build sturgeon passage, you wouldn't necessarily have a fish ladder because sturgeon can't use them. Um, but you could use like the nature ways that go around it. Or if you had a really, really low grade rock ramp, um, they'd be able to get through something like that, especially with the velocity. Um, but yeah, it's mostly just uh, the, the community surrounding the dam and the the recreational economics tied to it is why it hasn't been removed and it's still operating um, fairly well so there's no currently no issue of it you know falling down and posing a hazard uh, thank you so much Jess that's yeah. um, all questions online and um, we're a little over time so okay thank, thank you <laughs> all right well thank you guys very much